as we've been hearing all day, people are at the heart of innovation. They're what competitiveness is all about. Um, there's clearly a global race for talent. Some will say that talent is the 21st century oil. And you know, since the council's inception almost 30 years ago, we've been deeply involved in this space. In fact, I was thinking back to our very seminal report in 1998, winning the skills race, which really articulated in, in, a, in a very deep way the challenges of skills development back then. And when you think now, fast forward to where we are today, the whole world is radically changed in terms of what's needed to respond to the opportunities for a meaningful life and remuneration from skills and capability and talent and learning. Um, as we heard in the Deloitte Council uh, Manufacturing Competitiveness Survey, talent again was at the top of the list. Um, we have a fabulous group of leaders here that are going to discuss this from their perspectives, um, representing, of course, again, universities, industry, laboratories. And I, I want to thank our executive committee member, uh, Pradeep Kosla, Chancellor Kosla, for being our moderator, and thank also our executive committee member, um, Nick Pinchik, for being with us representing the industry view from Snap-on, and our labor member, uh, Sean McGarvey, from the uh, Building Trades, and Chancellor Rebecca Blank from University <coughs> of Wisconsin. Thank you all. And I know, well, Pradeep, you need to stir it up a little bit all now. All right. Yes, ma'am. We'll do it. So thank you, Deborah. And let's start with an observation. So if you go back to the 19th century, I know it's hard for some of us to go back there, but we can read books. Uh, the economy was driven by agriculture and uh, mining. 20th <coughs> century, let's call it industrial revolution. 21st century, let's call it like knowledge revolution. Uh, it starts before the 21st century, but nonetheless, those are the drivers of the economy. You look at our stock price, stock markets, right? S&P 30 years ago, 80% is tangible assets. Like uh, GE used to be a big company 30 years ago. Uh, 30 years later, 80% uh, is intangible assets, including eyeballs. So how many eyeballs you control really has a big impact on your market value. So all of this tells you that the nature of jobs has changed. And we can feel it, but we don't know exactly how it has changed. So I want to start with Sean and have him take an example, pick one of your, the trades you represent, and just talk us through as to how the jobs and their needs and requirements have changed uh, in the last 30 years or so. Well, we, we've got a real live example going on right now. We're, we're building uh, two new nuclear units in Waynesboro County, Georgia, for Georgia Power uh, and Southern Nuclear. And we will hit peak employment for uh, manual labor, the craft on the site, uh, sometime in the next two years at 6,000 people. That'll be 6,000 iron workers, pipe fitter welders, electricians, et cetera. And if you go back to the last time we built new nuclear, uh, the last new nuclear unit from uh, a Greenfield site came online was in the late 80s. And we maxed out on that project with about 12,500 craft uh, at peak. So the uh, evolution of technology, the uh, off-siting of fabrication, unitization, um, has made us more productive and required a lot less workers uh, to actually perform the what traditionally was called stick-built construction on the site. It's brought down the cost. It's exp expedited the, the time frame from uh, moving dirt to operations. Uh, so that's a pretty dramatic change in 25 years uh, with requiring half of the labor force that it required 25 years ago. That's interesting, and we'll come back to that in a second, but let me go to Nick. So how, how has your need changed uh, in terms of what you need to be successful for your company? Well, look, our company, uh, we manufacture in the United States. 80% of what we sell off our vans in the United States is made here, and a hand tool is 50% labor. And how that's been accomplished is that what we produce is a, an increasingly automated factory, but bigger and bigger workforce, but more and more customized product aimed at smaller and smaller needs in the marketplace. So we utilize the one inalienable advantage an American manufacturer has, that is proximity to the world's greatest market. It's hard to project a 65,000 SKU, a 65,000 uh, uh, 
uh, unit product line, 10,000 miles in 12 time zones. So even as our business has automated, it's become more demanding in terms of skills from the ind individual workers. So we use more workers today, but they're turning out a wider array of tools. That's one of the huge differences from 30 years ago. I see. So Becky, you represent one of the top universities in the country and across every dimension one can imagine. And people always say, you know, universities never change. Walk us through where has Wisconsin changed in the last 30 years or last five years? Just yeah, pick. Well, yeah. <laughs> the biggest change, and this is not unique to Wisconsin, this is true, I think, of every right. public institution, has been a set of institutional changes that have driven other changes. And that is primarily the disinvestment of the state in, uh, in our schools. So 40 years ago, the state was paying about half of my expenses. Um, right now, they pay 14%. And so we've really scrambled to build a new financial model. And that has happened at the same time, this is important, that the demand for our services and the number of applicants that we have coming at us and the number um, and the requirement that we show value for every dollar that we spend has really gone up. So we have increasing demand and we have you know, declining public resources. And it's done several things. That's first of all made us more entrepreneurial. If you went back even 10 years ago, we primarily served the traditional undergraduate, 18 to 22, and the traditional graduate student, mid-20s. We are running a far wider mix of programs now for professional masters, for older students, for certification programs, hybrid, you know, outside learning type programs with, you know, so, you know, we've responded and that both matches demand outside, but it also responds to some of our financial issues. The other real change is an increasing demand that we prepare our students globally, not right. just locally. And, um, you know, that both has an effect on who we want at our institution in terms of diversity and background, but also what type of experiences we want our students to, to have so that increasingly for a place like Wisconsin where we are, for, you know, we're, we are privileged to have be a four-year residential college for many of our students, um, it's not just about classes. It has to be about outside classroom experiences overseas in internships. Right. Hands on. So let me yeah. follow up on that, right? So I kind of feel your pain. So I'm <laughs> glad I'm asking the question do. to you and not you <laughs> to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we know that in this economy, and we just heard this, uh, there's a significant mismatch of uh, talent and skills, mm -hmm. as in jobs that, are, that need the skills are not available in the marketplace, and the skills that the young men, men, men and women have, nobody needs on the other side. Right. So walk us through, like when you build your curriculum, when you think about the future of education, how does your faculty, your staff and everybody interact with the marketplace, you know, whether it be industrialists yeah. like Nick or uh, IT companies like Google and factor in their demands or the, the craftspeople yeah. into your curriculum. So I'd make three quick responses to that. First of all, and I think this hasn't changed. We are more than anything else about teaching people to learn how to learn, okay. right? And I think that's even more important for our students today than it probably was 40 years ago, because you know they're going to be through multiple jobs. And, and that requires a distributional set of requirements. They learn communication as well as technology. They learn writing as well as coding, that type of thing. Secondly, um, as I mentioned, we, we increasingly are focusing not just on the in-classroom experience, but the out-of-classroom experience, and trying to increase the number of people who have internships. One of the things I'm proud of is we place more students out in international experiences than anyone else in the Big Ten. You know, and um, you know, those, you know, that out-of-classroom stuff is important. The third thing, and this is really important, I think, for, for, for many schools, and I, I think we're a little ahead of the curve on this one. The professional schools, the engineering school, the education school, the uh, 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 the business school has always been quite good at preparing people for jobs. It is the majority of our students who are out there in the liberal arts for whom we've given almost no career counseling and guidance. And the only time they think about this is in the second semester of their senior year when suddenly they have to find a job, right? And it's obviously an overstatement. But so we are really within our liberal arts college, and this is all four divisions from you know the biological and natural sciences all the way over to the arts and the social sciences. Um, putting together experiences in their sophomore year where we want them to take a one credit course that focuses on what are you interested in doing, how does your major get there, how do people who graduated from your major, what are right. they doing 10 years later, and putting them in touch with alumni so they can think through what they need to do in the next two years of school to be ready 
for the jobs right. that they want to hold. And doing that type of career preparation for students who aren't in the professional schools, I think is something that all schools need to be about doing more of. I see. So let's go to Nick. So Nick, you just heard from one of the leading schools in the country. And I think just about every school would respond the way Becky mm -hmm. did. We right? love the University of Wisconsin. Matt. Right. We place many we of our students. We love it. Yes. We, we have a lot of graduates. Right here in this we room, all love yeah. graduates, so the question, I know. <laughs> yes. Right. So the question for you is, of I can course, answer without of course question you would hire that. somebody from that school, right. Right? right? But then once you hire them, would you retrain them, re-educate them, put them <laughs> to a skill? What would you do? Or are they hitting the ground running for you? Well, anybody who comes from the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. Uh, is at uh, Madison. You know, it's tremendous. Thank you. Actually, actually, I want to offer, I think you're addressing the wrong question. Yeah. Okay. I think yeah. you're looking at the wrong question. Yeah. Well, okay, the, pose the, the right question. The middle question. class is shrinking, mm -hmm. right? And yet we have a skills gap. How come if the middle class is shrinking, we can't fill these jobs? Mm -hmm. And I think the right construct is to look at it this way. America moves forward on the brilliance of the few, a few great, great ideas, brilliant people that graduate mm -hmm. from San Diego and, mm -hmm. and Madison. And it also moves forward by the efforts of the many that amplify mm -hmm. those ideas. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that the, we have brilliant people. Look at the number of Nobel Prizes. 902 Nobel Prizes since 2001. We won 39% of them. Mm -hmm. Now, you might say we built up a lead, but since 2001, we've won 44%. So we're getting even better. So it's not the universities providing brilliant people that's the problem or providing ideas. We feel this instinctively, Google and iPhone and all this stuff. The problem is it's the efforts of the many. Our, our middle class is not trained properly to deal with the new work, as you would say. So I say one of the major problems is not in the university, it is in career and technical education. The upskilling of the American workforce, mm -hmm. the, 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 the building of career and technical education is the seminal issue of our time beyond business taxes, beyond immigration, beyond anything else. It's the most important issue of our time. Fair, so that's mm -hmm. a fair characterization, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. that is a perfect segue to Sean, because 40 years ago, he would represent the middle class, which would be the working class, uh, building the houses, building the factories, and building the products that we all use, right? So maybe he can educate us as to, what does your association do in terms of helping uh, bring education, skill upgrades that Nick was talking about? Or is that the wrong question also? No, that's probably the central <laughs> part of mm -hmm of what we do at, at our at our base we're we're really a workforce development operation don't get me wrong we're a union but we're really a recruiter trainer and deployer of skilled craft we operate in the united states 1600 training centers uh in every state across this country we spend a billion dollars a year with a b of our own money uh funding filling those uh, training centers, the physical infrastructure, the instructors developing the curriculum, keeping up with the technology, and then recruiting and training that workforce in that training center. The one thing we don't do is we don't give out false hope and we don't train people for jobs that don't exist. So in the construction industry right now, you probably people read periodicals or Wall Street Journal article about the about the skill shortage and the sh construction worker shortage and where are they going to come from? Well, I got to tell you that we're not having a problem. And that when you talk about where the major industrial explosion uh, due to, in a good way, due to, you know, the, the natural resource finds in North America across the Gulf Coast where, you know, this issue is becoming critical, I'm running about 50% capacity in my training apparatus down there. Why is that? Okay, because there's standards attached to working with the building trades. And I'm not recruiting people to come into a training program that I don't have a job mm -hmm. for. We don't make widgets. Mm -hmm. It's not just in time manufacturing. You don't know, train somebody to be a pipe fitter welder, put them on the shelf, and when the customer calls, you send them. We need a, a pipeline of work so that we know how many people to recruit because in our membership, everybody's an owner. Everybody's an owner operator. They have a stake in that union. And the last thing they want is for you know, the needs to be for 100 pipe fitter welders, yet we've got 300 of them. My employment opportunities go way down when that happens. So we have the capacity, we have the opportunity, but there are all kinds of factors that we compete against. There, quite honestly, there's a couple going on in the Hill right now where they're trying to double the number of H-2B visas under the omnibus, okay? And I can tell you where those folks are going to go 
and who they're going to compete against. And I, I know we're going to not going to talk about wage inequity and the shrinking middle class and why is it shrinking? Well, I can give you a few reasons why it's happening. So we have this capacity. Okay, we have the ability to recruit, train, deploy this workforce. We consider ourselves a vendor supplier. What we need is customers willing to make a commitment, just like if they're going to buy tools, they need to buy the services that we sell, which is the most highly skilled, most productive, safest craft workforce in the world, okay, over a period of time, which enables us to recruit, get somebody through the training program, and bring them out the other side, earning as they learn with a set of skills that make them safely in the middle class, not only for that family, for their generation, but for two generations, according to the studies that we have. Right. And the bonus with the building trades, not to, not to take up too much time, is the way we're structured today is, in almost all of our programs, when you come out of our apprenticeship, you have an associate's degree from an accredited community college. Some of our training programs are their own community college. And then through our training programs in our mm -hmm. unions, you have the opportunity to go on through a distance learning program to get your four-year bachelor's degree Right. when you come out of your apprenticeship. So in six or seven years, not only have you earned as you learned and made three or four hundred thousand dollars, you've now also got your bachelor's degree, a set of skill sets that will last you a lifetime, and a pathway to go anywhere you want with your educational background without debt. Right, so that's an important point, and we'll come back to debt because that's a really important issue. But before I get there, I want to get back to what Nick was saying. So we agree the middle class is shrinking, right? Nobody's going to argue that. Stock market, right, even today, went up 2%. It's the highest at, at its highest point uh, in the history of the stock market, right? And in spite of that, there are no, the <coughs> wealth distribution is very distorted, which is why the middle class is shrinking. So I'm trying to, and my well, first of all, First yeah. of all, I don't accept yeah. that idea that the middle class is shrinking because of wealth distortion. That may be a result of the middle class. Okay, shrinking. fair. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. But mm -hmm. the point I was trying to make is, that the nature of jobs is changing. There are more high paying jobs than before and there are more low paying jobs than before. And there's right swath of jobs in the middle that pretty much are non-existent right now. I disagree with that. And you so disagree does the, with so that? Okay, let's talk so, about it. So does yeah. the National Association of Manufacturers. The trades is a, is a different thing, but, but the National Association of Manufacturers will tell you, and these are 14,000 manufacturers, they say they have 600,000 jobs that are going begging because they can't find the skills. And they say it'll go to 3.4 million. And there are reasons for this. Now, one of the reasons why the stock market is up, yes, people are paying for intellectual, mm -hmm. intellectual capacity, but they're right. also paying premiums on top of premiums. Private equity buys mm -hmm. from private equity, and therefore, the U.S. economy is based more and more on the velocity of money as opposed to the velocity of goods. Right. And so that's, that's one thing. But let me come back to the middle class, and let me come back to what, what, what Sean said. One of the reasons why the middle class is shrinking is because for every idea, there's a competition to be the amplifier for this. The amplifier gets chosen. Henry Ford chose the greatest amplifier in the world. That was the American workforce energetic and committed in his day. But today, even though our workforce is energetic and committed, it may, the people in Shanghai are also energetic and committed, and therefore they need to be trained to differentiate themselves. This is the fundamental thing. Now, part of it has to do with industry working with education to call in the airstrikes and make sure that training is efficacious. That is one of the, as I said, the most seminal issue of our time, that's one. But number two, which hasn't been discussed here, is there's a heck of a PR problem. If you want to be a welder, you are considered to have settled for the consolation prize of our society. I want the people in this room to think, with respect, about how you would feel if your son or daughter, niece or nephew, told you they were going to be a car mechanic. This is what other people's kids do. You see, we've, we've lost the respect for the dignity of work. And one of the things we need to do to re-energize the middle class, the jobs are there. Manufacturing in the United States can continue with these middle jobs. It happens at Snap-on. But the, they, they are viewed as settling for something. If, if you doubt this, check the, check the New York Times. 514 names in the New York Times, 2% were technical. Even engineers, mm -hmm. not, not only technical people. Wall Street Journal, of course, was a lot better. That was 1.5%. The Medal of Freedom, the Medal of Freedom. Since 2006, the Medal of Freedom, 93 people have been given the Medal of Freedom, freedom for making a significant difference to America. Nine were engineers or technical people of any type. Almost 30 were entertainers. 
Now, what does that say about our view of technical people, engineers or scientists or certainly welders and car mechanics on the hierarchy of things? And this is working on our environment. Fair. So you may be yeah. right, but you're not helping us explain the issue that there's a significant job dislocation going on. The nature of jobs is changing. The job yesterday does not exist today. Yes, because, okay, I, first of all, that's an oversimplification of the situation. Right. But I know you would like it to be that way, but it's not necessarily, <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessarily exactly that way. The people do some of the same things, but they have to be more upskilled. And just what I am saying, right. though, what I am saying is people need to be trained to do this. The people in, in um, if you go to a, the Milwaukee plant at Snap-on, it makes sockets. Most people, when they close their eyes, think this would, the people in that plant would be working in damp, dirty, and dumb conditions. It is very far from that, but they, do, they still produce sockets, but they produce them with a level of intellectual acumen that didn't exist 50 years ago, and that intellectual ac acumen can be dispensed by community colleges. One of the things I'm trying to say is, is that welding, like engineering, or like being mm -hmm. a CEO, or like being a college president, is a business, is, is a profession which keeps your family warm and safe and dry and is worthy of pride and dignity and welding and the ability to learn lifelong are not mutually exclusive. That's fair. So. That's fair. I, can I answer this yeah, in a slightly please. different way? Um, what we do know is that jobs that basically have repetitive actions that do not require a lot of judgment is what and, and increasingly, there are a number of what were middle income jobs that are falling into that category and are jobs where, you know, the, you, know you can outsource easily. Um, you know, so someone who reads, radi you know, reads x-rays. Right. Um, you know, you can outsource that now in a way you couldn't. And um, there's only going to be one answer to this, which is there are shortages at the skilled level, and that is opening up access to those skilled jobs to more folks. And there are large parts of our society who simply do not have the, um, uh, the either the affordability or the experiences coming out of the schools that they went to um, to acquire those skills by the time they're age 18 or 20. And um, our need to close some of the gaps, you know, and I, I, the income gaps and the you know the widening inequality. Um, that, that you're talking about in part between different groups, I think is all a reaction to, uh, you know, it, 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 it's the result, not the cause, of what's coming out of what's happening at younger ages. And if you look at the differences in investment in children, investment of parental time, investment of parental money, investment by the schools, types of classes people have, you see widening inequality in all of that. And so we are basically throwing away large numbers of people in this society who have full capability to go to great schools and get those skills, but they don't have, you know, they're never gonna get there. Um, and that type of access is what we need to be working on more than anything else. So that's interesting. So that argues that education is uh, absolutely necessary for everything we do, right? I mean, uh, if, did I get that right? You know, I, I, the there, there are always making? going to be some jobs, you know, right. particularly in the service sector where that's less true, but increasingly in the United States, our comparative advantage is you know, it's the high tech manufacturing, it's the right. high innovation areas, it's requiring skilled labor. So I'm trying to look at the disaggregation that's going on in the whole economy right now. So I'll give you an example, right? It used to be that to be a hotel owner, you had to have assets like a hotel. Today, mm -hmm. all you need is a two bedroom house and then you can rent the, one, mm -hmm. the other bedroom using Airbnb. Mm -hmm. To be a taxi driver where the metal costs a lot of money, right now the cost of the metal is down to zero thanks to Uber. Right, so there's a whole lot of mm -hmm. uh, tectonic shifts that are happening that have taken away value from existing industries and jobs mm -hmm. and put them in new places where instead of people having six careers in a lifetime, people now talk about having six jobs simultaneously, mm -hmm. right? And I wanna know, uh, okay, so Nick, of course, doesn't agree with this, but I'm trying to figure out, like. <laughs> overrated. <laughs> right. I, I don't know if it is overrated. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. I have become a fan of Uber. I can tell you, mm -hmm. short of CEO driving Uber, uh, every so often I've thought of driving Uber to know what my students are doing in my campus, right? <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, that's a good I have idea, actually. a right. lot mm -hmm. of professional yeah, people right. who drive Uber mm -hmm. to get some extra money mm -hmm. because their other job, which is a professional job, is not high paying enough, 
right? And I'm trying to think through the education system that needs to change, the community colleges and the seamless integration from high school to community college to four-year colleges, technical schools, which I agree with Nick, you know, we in this egalitarian society have basically written off uh, technical school mm -hmm. education, the one mm -hmm. that uh, Sean's talking about. And these are amazing. In fact, I was visiting a high school and this young man says, you know, I picked a career for myself. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to be an underwater welder. And it never crossed my mind that underwater welders make like 150 plus a year because it's such a dangerous job. And this guy seems to be good at it, right? But those are the types of things. And I agree with you, but I'm trying to figure out what do we need to change in our education system to make those attractive so that the economies, now don't tell me the families have to change in well, addition to that. I mean, you, know, that you know, everyone wants, access and affordability, and we have that right now in our public schools. Anyone can go to public school right. and basically at zero cost, but you don't get always get quality out of that, right? And, you know, it's a really tough question as to how do you improve, you know, this is, you know, Randy and others areas of expertise, not my, what do you need to be doing to improving the, particularly the middle schools and the high schools? Right now, you know, it doesn't matter how you test kids, there's a number of different tests that show this. If you line people up by ability from the lowest quartile to the highest quartile, if you are a high quartile child at the bottom of the income distribution, you are far less likely to go to college than if you were a low quartile child at the top end of the income distribution. So, you know, the, the, the outcomes here are not well matched to merit in a way that we like to think in the United States they should be. Right. And, um, you know, and, and that's what we've got to work on more it, than it, anything it's, else. It's, it's always, yeah. I, it's always yeah. I think sometimes you can get, in business you have this experience. Sometimes you can get captured by the warts. In other words, you get captured by trying to fix your weaknesses as opposed to invest in the commons, you know, in other mm -hmm. words, your mm -hmm. strengths. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anything about K through 12, except I'm an expert because I went to school in K through 12. You know, that's probably all I know. But I would simply say, if, if, if it were me and I was running the world and I was doing that, I would say simply trust the teachers. I would simply say that if you trust the teachers, I think that would go a long way to making things possible. But you obviously are not a contemporary parent. Uh, possibly true. <laughs> Th that's, that's right. Probably true, but, I, but uh, okay, I used to be a parent, though. But I think, I think there's something to be said for that, honestly. Yeah, my agree. parents trusted my teachers, right? You know? I have the scars to prove it still, right. you know, <laughs> facially. Anyway. But, but let, me, let me come back to the, the answer about moving forward in terms of careers. K through 12 is a very complicated issue. I say the one thing we would do is trust the teachers. And he, but I think the universities are doing a great job. I honestly do believe this. I think we're on the leading edge. We have the best universities. It's the middle that's the problem. And I, I say, I come back to what I said before. I think industry can partner with technical schools to better, just what, just what Sean is saying with the union, matching it to jobs. There's a word called demand driven. There's an mm -hmm. organization called National, uh, National uh, Coalition of Certification Centers mm -hmm. that works with community college and says, if you teach these kinds of things, we will certify that your people can wield this kind of technology. Right. And this creates a job which is important. By the way, 120, there's nothing that says $125,000 is the entry point for pride and dignity. You see, it is, it is not necessarily, that's one of the things I think we've lost from when sure. I was a kid. We didn't say, we didn't respect people because they made a lot of money. We respected them because they, they were a, a member of the community. Now, making a lot of money is better, but that's one thing. But the second thing, I, I still want to come back to the idea. If you start peeling it apart, and I, 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 I challenge you to look at the paper or look at the way people talk about this or look at the Medal of Freedom, we tend to want to channel our kids the capable and the, in, and, the, and the disadvantaged, away from being those things. I understand, but I can the, tell you. And therefore, you. the way to start, stop it is for people like you to say, and me, and, and the President of the United States, to car start characterizing the welding and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and all these middle jobs as a national calling as opposed to a national burden. Right, so but, this is where Sean, I think, is trying to say something. I, I'm, I'm sure he is. Picking up off of, <laughs> off of Nick, you know, to the president's credit, I have my disagreements him, with him on many issues. He has shown a great spotlight on exactly what you're talking about, Nick. Okay, this president, uh, Secretary Perez, uh, Vice President Biden, have put a huge spotlight 
on apprenticeship and using the model of apprenticeship to move people, okay? Teach them the skill sets, earning as they learn and not accumulating debt. They've done a great job with that. Um, and we, we just had National Apprenticeship Week, I think it was three weeks ago. We did events at our training centers all over the country. Got great press. People actually paid attention, so that was a, a good start. But, you know, you talked about that underwater welder, and, and you're right. You know, the problem isn't that we can't attract people for our jobs across wide swaths of this country because when we put out apprenticeship applications in crafts across the Northeast, the Midwest, and the West, people sleep out. Like, mm -hmm. like it's Black Friday, mm -hmm. camping out to be first in line to get an application. Okay, why? Because that's a $100,000 plus job with a good benefit package and mm -hmm. continuing education throughout your career. Um, I have two daughters that are, that are really smart, uh, uh, great women, all right? Both of them have their master's degrees. I'm so proud of them because, you know, uh, I don't have a degree. Um, I will tell you that their combined investment in their education is 400000 and when I leave here, I'll be going to my part-time job at 7-Eleven uh, <laughs> to help see? continue to pay that off. <laughs> One is a clinical social worker. Mm -hmm. The upside on her earning potential in her career, if she was at the top of her field right now, is about seventy grand. Mm -hmm. And the other one is a, is a teacher up in Connecticut. And with the struggles that, if Randy could tell you about collective bargaining in the teaching profession, her upside isn't that great. Where, if I could have steered them, but no parent wants to, I didn't dissuade them, right. okay, from going into the skilled crafts. Would I love one of my daughters to be an underwater welder? You're damn right. Because they could work six months a year for $75,000 and those good benefits. The disconnect, I'm sorry, but the disconnect is, and if you go back to the, to the 2012 campaign when you had both Governor Romney and President Obama talking about what Nick's talking about, what the national manufacturers and others have said. There's 300,000 advanced manufacturing jobs in this country that are going wanting. We can't find applications. They don't have the skill sets. Well, let, let's talk. Do you want to talk reality? Mm -hmm. Reality is they want somebody with an MIT's degree, an MIT degree that's going to work for 14 bucks an hour. If you want to attract people, you raise the economics. Because I guarantee you, if they were paying Car mechanics, two hundred thousand dollars a year. They'd be lined up out that door, wanting to be a car mechanic. It always comes down to the compensation and what you're willing to invest. Now the question is, and it's in it's in our materials, is where's that breaking point? Where's the breaking point where we where we raise the economics to solve the problem enough for the worker, where we then keep the business competitive in a worldwide economy? All right. We're in a capitalist society. We're always going to be a capitalist society. That's always going to be the rub for us. I'm always going to advocate, like Samuel Gompers, more, more, more. I want more for the working people in this country. I want a bigger middle class. I want them to earn more. I want them to enjoy more. And if I was an entrepreneur or if I was a CEO, I want more in my responsibility to my board of directors and my stockholders. That's always going to be the rub. But we can solve a lot of problems in this country when we're talking about the issues we're talking about when we raise the economics. And I will tell you where I think this country is missing the boat right now. In advanced manufacturing and in the abundant, God-given abundant supply of natural resources in North America, both gas and oil. If we don't get an energy policy that works, we will blow the opportunity of a century okay right. to bring manufacturing back to the United States and I got to tell you my friends in the chemical manufacturing and gas and oil they're middle class jobs the people in operations are middle class jobs are paying my members to build and maintain their facilities middle class jobs but we got policy makers and radicals who want to take us back to the stone age that's right. got to be figured out and that will be a big part of putting right. that floor under that middle class for the next generation of Americas using what resources we already have. In right. I just, have one, thing, I just have one thing to, to, whip, to yeah. pull us together is, look, I agree with almost everything you said, right? I think, but, I, but I'll come back to the issue is this, is that, you know, unless we, I, I, I want to, in, in agreement, unless we engage the great middle, prosperity will not continue here. This cannot be a society where a few people make a lot of money Right. And that mm -hmm. keeps us going mm -hmm. forward, like on the velocity of money. A lot of people say 
that American workers are a question, I say it's that therein lies the answer. The American workers are the answer. But I still say that it's a little more complicated than just wages, although wages is an important point. I come back to your daughters. Your daughters weren't focused on wages when they wanted to be social workers. They are now. And, 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 and <laughs> they, right, but the thing is, they are. But that isn't, that is an issue. There, there are community colleges in the United States near us where 25% right. of the students already have four-year degrees. Mm -hmm. And so I come back to the question of, I, I honestly believe this has to do with the respect for the dignity and pride of work. Actually, I agree with you, but let me leave you with a thought that might be uncomfortable, right? When you, as an individual, have investments which are nearly sunk investments, as in your house or your car, and there is a technology or a business model that allows you to get marginal return on that investment, like Uber, for example, Airbnb, you are now doing the work for much less cost because you consider that investment to be a sunk investment, thereby depressing the labor market in general. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the future. This is where technology is taking us. When it comes to 3D manufacturing, uh, Uber, Airbnb, I can go down the list. Mm -hmm. You and I can end this note, end this conversation on a disagreement, but I think everyone, everybody, I want everybody to be thinking about this because a lot of us are trying to extract value out of our sunk investments, and that is depressing the labor market. So. I will just offer that we keep investing and we keep hiring. Thank you. Okay. More power Thank to you. you. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. All right.